I want to begin by welcoming all of you that are watching uh, as we're welcoming into this service uh, all of our, our Olathe campus, our Blue Valley campus, and our Lee Summit campuses. Uh, I, I, we're, we're on good, everything good, guys. So this morning uh, I started and I did the whole spill and there was no sound. And so I had to go get a microphone and start over. But uh, that's not the only challenge that we've had this weekend. But we are uh, especially... Uh, Thankful that all of you could brave the snow and be here, and, and I know you're going to be blessed. I know you've already been blessed by the donut wall and uh, the services, and, and I know you're going to be blessed because uh, you made that effort to get here today, and we, we do appreciate it. Uh, this has been a fantastic weekend. Our, our, the weekend is we celebrate our 50th anniversary as a church, and today actually is the day 50 years ago, you know, that 47 people began in that rented basement. Uh, and uh, of a donut shop. That's, that's why the donuts are here today. And uh, God has done amazing things. And this weekend has been a very special time. As Friday night, we had the, this place, the room was just totally packed, and we had an unbelievable night together. All day Saturday, uh, all our Saturday afternoon, people were streaming in and out, going through the, the pictures, uh, through the decades, and the gospel lads uh, just killed it last night. We had just a wonderful night, and we've already had a great first service this morning. And I know that, um, I know this is going to be a blessing, and we thank all of you, especially there's several hundred volunteers that have worked really, really hard, taking care of a myriad of details. And I just, I so appreciate all of you who have made that effort to help make this weekend everything that it's supposed to be. Everybody's been telling me how wonderful, uh, what a wonderful job I did, and I did do a good job, okay? <laughs> and I just kind of got out of the way and, and let everybody do their thing. So um, that's the best thing that I could do. Hey, uh, we have a special day to kind of cap off the weekend. We have a special speaker. His name is Barry Cameron. For those of you that, that weren't here earlier in the week, um, Barry was the youth minister here at uh, the Overland Park campus. At that time, the church was called Johnson County Christian Church from 1977 through 1980. Uh, at that time, uh, my brother Jack was in high school and I was away at college, but came home for the weekends and uh, got trouble, I mean, got spent some time with Barry uh, at the time. And uh, he did a wonderful job. Uh, his, his youth program here was a model youth program. And after uh, he was here, God called him on. He went to Florida and did a senior ministry there. And 12 years later, he moved to uh, Arlington, Texas. And he took a church, uh, which is now, they've changed their names, and they're now called Crossroads Christian Church. And under his ministry, the last 26 years, the church has grown from an average attendance of about 180 to uh, hitting over 8,000 some weekends. Uh, Barry is a published author. He has a bestseller book called The ABCs of uh, Financial Freedom. Is that right? Did I get it right this morning? Okay. I know the book. I've read the book. I highly encourage it. He has uh, Contagious uh, Generosity, a couple other books. And he's really in demand uh, as a speaker around the country, especially challenging Christians uh, to uh, obey the principles of Scripture, to live debt-free, and to support uh, God's ministry through their local church. And he has a, a great ministry for that. And someday we'll bring him back just to talk about that. But you're going to be blessed today. Now, I do need to make a couple of, of addendums to some things he said Friday night, okay? And uh, Friday night, he told some stories, and I'm going to do a quick recap for those that aren't here. Um, there, was, there was a summer, and my mom and dad were off on a mission trip to Haiti, and they brought Jack and I in because Renee was somewhere else, and just Jack and I were, I think it's the first time. I was a young college student. He was in high school, and he was going to leave us alone for one week in the house. And he brought us in. He said, now, guys... He goes, don't burn the house down, and I, I don't, I don't want to hear anything any, in trouble with the police. And I don't know why my dad said that, because I had never had any trouble with the police. <laughs> I had never had any trouble with the police. But, but uh, the first night that they were gone, we had a bunch of buddies over the house, had pizza, and we started the basketball games on the driveway. We had spotlights all over the house. I'd brought lamps out, taken the shades off. They were all over, and we had the music blaring. And uh, about one in the morning when we were still playing and shouting, uh, the police came uh, to the house. And so uh, we really had just lost track of the time, and we, we kind of handled that. So we all went to Denny's for uh, breakfast at 2 in the morning. The next night, we all gathered again at my house, and we can't play basketball. What do we do? And Barry said, well, you know, the church is under construction, and this room didn't have any carpet or anything in it. There weren't any light fixtures, just emergency lighting. Let's go down there and, and play ball tag, right? And Barry made up a game. It, was, it, it involved 
guys could get bloody noses and stuff, so it was a good game. And so we all, we all came down, and sure enough, uh, the police drive, by, saw, police drive by, saw people in the building come in with their guns, shouting, hands up, or we will shoot you, you know. And <clears throat> so then we went to Denny's again, uh, and... <laughs> Barry, uh, Barry got everyone there, and I, I would never have told this, but he, he told it, so, but he, he took it out of the vault. He was scared he was going to get fired, so he made us all promise that we would never, ever tell this story, all right? And, but he told it. Now, here's the rest of the story, all right? About, about two weeks later, uh, my dad called my brother and I into the living room and asked us this question. He goes, is, is there anything that happened while we were gone that you guys need to tell about, you need to confess? And, and see, this is what had actually happened. My mom was at a beauty parlor, and she was sitting there, and there was this lady that was having her hair done talking to the beautician, and she was telling her how her son, who was a rookie cop on the Overland Park Police Force, Last night had, uh, the other, like last week, had pulled his, on his first week of patrol, had pulled his gun and almost shot the preacher's kids at that church where they're building that building <laughs> down there. And what's the odds of that, right? And uh, I, I, so dad goes, is there anything you want? We didn't know this, right? We didn't know what they knew. And he says, is there anything you guys want to confess? And I'm, I'm going through, there were some other things that actually happened that week, but... <laughs> Uh, I, I'm going through the list, and I, I basically said, Dad, I said, because I thought this was the most likely, I said, um, we, I, we just lost track of the time. We, we're just playing basketball. If they just would have come and told us they didn't need to call the police on us, right? And he said, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, and my brother Jack, with his classic line, way to go, Reg. You know, <laughs> so we're busted twice. But... Um, We've had, a, we've had a lot of fun with Barry being here, but I asked him to come as, as a guy who really had a lot of his life and, and ministry formed while serving here at, at the Johnson County Christian Church, Legacy Christian Church, to come and to challenge us with this last well. We've been redigging the old wells. We've been looking at the values that the church was founded upon and celebrating those things, but also looking ahead to how are we going to live these values. And so he's going to come in, in just a minute, and he, he's going to challenge you. And I want you to hear what the Lord is saying today uh, through our brother, okay? Because it, it, it's, the, it's the thing we need to hear at Legacy Christian Church starting tomorrow. Before he comes, the gospel lads are going to come and sing one more song for us. Uh, these guys... We're a little bit younger there. They were in the donut shop in, in early 1970 and uh, came back countless times through, through the years. And we just have been so blessed by them this weekend. And I want all of you to, to get blessed one more time. Thank you. 
change my dreams, Lord, change my plans, for I'm placing my whole life in your hands, and if you call me Certainly, one of the old wells that that we need to redig continually, because maybe it's the core, is that of the of the Great Commission, and this this heartbeat, this passion for evangelism, both personal and being part of a church that's that's going and sending uh, yeah. in the world. Yeah. And I know that was I know that was part of the beginning. Could you talk a little bit about the churches? Uh, early commitment to both personal, local evangelism, and world missions. Reggie, we, uh, we, this church started with a passion to reach the lost for Christ. That was going to be our main purpose, and that is the main purpose of the church. We uh, immediately started sending our people out in the community, going door to door, just trying to find where people were that uh, were not actively involved for Christ anywhere else. And when we found those names, we would, we would go to the door. Uh, we would just say, my name is Ronnie Epps. I'm from the Johnson County Christian Church. We're doing a survey in the area. And you folks, are you active in a church anywhere? If they told us yes, we said, well, we're thankful you are, and God bless you, and we moved on to the next door. But by doing that, we found a whole lot of people who were not really involved anywhere. It didn't mean they were atheists or something, but they just hadn't found a church home yet. And so we would bring those uh, names together. We'd put them on the main list of our paper. We would start calling in their homes. And, and the passion was we wanted to win them to Christ. And we won many of them to the Lord. And uh, that became our dream and our goal here on the local level. And I believe even today, we still have that same passion. Now, uh, I can remember we, we had some young people who grew up here. And uh, we, were, we had a big emphasis on 
developing young people for ministry. And uh, we had a, a lot of our kids went to Bible college to prepare to serve the Lord. And many of them uh, have served the Lord for years now in ministry. And we feel like that was a part of our evangelistic thrust. I had a dream that someday we would have a missionary on every continent in the world. From that grew up here. Yeah. Yes, from this church. And uh, that's happening now. We see yeah. that uh, with uh, the kids who are in Africa. We yeah. call them kids, but they're wonderful servants of Jesus. Right. And uh, we're thankful that God has used us to do that. And that is a dream and a goal. And it seems like that the Lord has given to us the things we prayed for. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, that there would be new workers that go out into the harvest because the uh, harvest is plenteous, but the laborers were so few. Mm -hmm. We pray that because of our congregation and other congregations like it, those laborers will be provided as they're called by the Lord. Well, this has been a great weekend, and I cannot tell you what an honor it's been for Janice and I to uh, get to have the privilege to be here uh, this weekend and get to be a part of this. Janice and I have told people for years that our the most fun ministry we've ever had, and that includes every one of them, was being right here. And uh, my wife said, well, the reason why you, you said you loved us because you never did anything. All you did was play, <laughs> and that may be part of it, but... Uh, we have thoroughly enjoyed being here and uh, getting to be a part of honoring uh, Ronnie and Darlene and uh, the 47 people who started this church. Uh, I didn't remember that we got here so early on. We were here nine years after uh, they had begun. And to take on this massive building project, I've, I've built, uh, I'll be getting ready to build my 14th building project uh, here uh, uh, probably next fall, $24.5 million dollars. And we've raised all the money. This will be our fourth major project to raise all the money ahead of time before we break ground. And uh, that, that, uh, the heart for having it paid for before you uh, build it, I learned that here. I watched uh, Ronnie travel all around the country selling bonds to help pull, put this facility up. And, and, and to build this facility, look about, I was talking to Bob Patterson uh, last night, and Bob told me that building this new facility, the gym and this facility here, and they didn't even finish the downstairs, was over a million dollars. And, and to give you some, some kind of frame of reference for that, to do this today, to build what this church built by this property, built what they built within the first uh, seven, eight years of ministry, would be about 18 to 20 $22 million today. So you're talking about a near impossible feat that uh, Ronnie and Darlene and this, this little band of uh, people who decided to have a church down here in uh, Johnson County. It's pretty phenomenal. And uh, what's happened here over the years now, Legacy uh, Christian Church, four campuses. I mean, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to come back and talk to Reggie, figure out how we can do that. We're on one campus and if we're going to keep growing, we're going to have to have other ones like you do as well. But this has just been a wonderful uh, experience for us. Uh, Ronnie and Darlene have been like uh, parents to Janice and I. We were just young kids when we came here, and I, and I, I really didn't know what I was doing. I, I knew how to build a youth program. That wasn't hard. But uh, when I went to be a, when I went to be a, a pastor in Florida, uh, Ronnie said, he goes, Barry, you, you can't be a pastor. You'll be fired six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I can't imagine why he thought that. Maybe the, I would drive my car inside a building or, or I'd, I'd get his kids involved with the police. But, but, but uh, th that always kind of bothered me. And we were at a convention together at uh, the Iowa Christian Convention. You remember the Iowa Christian Convention? And, and, and Ronnie had gone to get a Coke or something. And I said, Darlene, i got to ask you a question. I said, Ronnie made a comment when I left. He said, he said Bear, Bearcat, you wouldn't make it six weeks without being fired. And I said, that's just always kind of bothered me. And I go, why would he say that? And she said, he didn't want you to leave. And uh, <laughs> the other side of the story is there were a lot of people that wanted me to leave. So, uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm kidding. I'm, I don't know where that came from. But, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of times uh, preacher's kids get a bad rap. 
And people say, well, you know, preacher's kids, they're just horrible. Uh, Renee and Jack, uh, they were in my youth group. And I mean, we, we were reaching the athletes and the cheerleaders and all the, the just amazing amounts of kids from all schools. And there was such great uh, rivalry between Shawnee Mission West and Shawnee Mission East and all that. And, and we just told them, we said, hey, you're, you're part of this church and we're all part of the same family. And don't wear, don't wear your letter jackets in here. We're all part of the same family. And there was a great, great uh, time there. And we enjoyed that. And to become friends with Reggie and Cher over the years, I mean, to know that we've been friends, I don't know how many friends you have for over 41 years and still be friends uh, today. That's, that's pretty amazing. And uh, what God has done here since uh, Reggie has come, and uh, don't think that we haven't been watching the transition of uh, how that all happened uh, here. I'm, 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 I'm rounding third, heading for home in my age, and uh, my son, I'm not saying that he'll be the guy that follows me, that's the, that's the decision of the elders, but, uh, you know, I'd sure want to model it uh, the way you guys did it here, and I'm proud of you, and, and it's just been wonderful to be here. And uh, Reggie asked me to preach uh, this Sunday, uh, this Sunday morning, and I told him, I said, I said, what do you want me to preach on? He said, well, I want you to challenge us to reach the lost. That's what, that's what this church is about. That's been the history from day one, and... Um, Last night, he was telling me that every time after he preaches that his mom says to him, that's the best sermon you've ever preached. And he also said that his dad always says, and I'm not giving you any more of my sermons. That's the last one. <clears throat> well, what I need to tell you this morning is this sermon is uh, Ronnie's sermon. And uh, I sat back here in a pew uh, back in, uh, I don't know if it was 19... Uh, 78, 79, and Ronnie preached a sermon one uh, Sunday morning from the text in uh, 2 Kings chapter 7, and I want you to turn there in your Bible, 2 Kings chapter 7, and uh, all I did was write the main points in my Bible. I couldn't write all the things down he was saying, but I wrote the main points in my Bible, and I remember when I got up out of church and I, and I went out, I, I said, I think that's the greatest challenge I've ever heard to go out and share our faith and reach the world, and so I thought that'd be appropriate if on this, uh, this 50th anniversary celebration, I preach one of your old sermons. So if you're in 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings chapter 7, I'll be there in just a moment. Uh, this is one of the most unusual stories in the Bible. In fact, some of it, when I say it, you'll, you'll recognize it. So I, I didn't know that's where that was in the Bible, but you'll, you'll recognize the story. The prophet Elisha makes a statement that a ferocious famine in Samaria is going to turn into a feast of fabulous proportions. He makes a statement. He says, tomorrow is going to be so great, you won't even believe it. And the truth of the matter is they didn't believe it. But before we get the story, I need to give you some background. Uh, there was a king of Syria named Ben-Hadad, and it seems that every time he got ready to attack the people of God, Israel, that uh, somehow his plans became public. And at first he thought it was a close associate. He thought maybe it was a confidant, maybe a member of his cabinet. But then he found out that or maybe one of his bodyguards. But then he found out that his problem was a preacher. Now, I know sometimes people in the church think their, their problem is the preacher. They, they never consider the fact it might be their own sin, but in this case, the problem was the preacher. It was a prophet named Elisha. So the king ordered the arrest and the imprisonment of Elisha and sent a great army after him to the city of Dothan. That's all in 2 Kings chapter 6. Under cover of darkness, this massive army completely surrounded the city. They set up camp waiting for just the right moment to arrest the minister of God. Well, verse 15 tells us early the next morning, Elisha's servant got up and he was going out to get some fresh air and he looked up and he saw as far as he could see, all the mountain ranges were Syrian soldiers. And he went back in and he said, Master, Master, get up. You're not going to believe it. We're completely surrounded by the Syrian army. And Elisha said, relax. Those that are with us are greater than those that are with them. And the servant left, and Elisha prayed that God would open up his eyes so he would see the real picture. And so the servant went outside, and this time when he, when he went outside, he, he saw the mountains with chariots of fire and all kinds of soldiers. The armies of heaven had showed up, and truly greater are those that are with us than those that are with them. Well, as the Syrians came down the mountainside, Elisha prayed again as he was praying that his servants' eyes would be opened. He prayed that the Syrian soldiers' eyes would be blinded. And sure enough, that's what happened. When they came and got to Elisha, they were totally blinded. They couldn't find their hand in front of their own face. And Elisha said to them, he said in verse 19, This is not the way, and this is not the city. 
Follow me and I will bring you to the man you seek. So they followed him. And he led them right into the city walls of Samaria, capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, right in front of Israel's king and all their soldiers. And then he prayed again that God would open their eyes. And when the Syrian army opened their eyes, they realized they were in it, the capital city of enemy territory, surrounded by all of their soldiers, facing certain death. But Elisha said to the king, he said, listen, don't, uh, don't kill them. Give them food and water and send them back to Syria, which is exactly what they did. Now, you would think, having received such mercy, such grace, that the king of, of Syria would never, ever again have come after God's people or the city of Samaria, right? Wrong. Verse 24 says, after this. How many after this experiences have you had in your life? Well, King Ben-Hadad and his entire army came back to Samaria, and they besieged it, verse 24 tells us. After all the mercy that had been extended to his army, he commanded his troops to besiege the city of Samaria. Now, there's a difference between attacking a city and besieging a city. Attacking a city, you storm the gates and you take no prisoners, kill everybody. But when you besiege a city, you surround it and cut off all sources of supply. You know, some of you have battled from time to time the devil trying to get you to just quit church altogether and not be here. And what he's trying to do is besiege you. He's not trying to attack you, storm in the gates and kill you and take you out of here. No, he's trying to besiege you and cut you off from all the sources of supply that God has for you. You know, I was, uh, got up early this morning about 5.30 and looked out the window. We knew a snowstorm was coming and, and uh, I, I looked out the window and it didn't look that bad to me at 5.30. I got a little worse after that. And, but, 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 but I looked out there and, 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 and down, we're, we're on the 10th floor and looking down there and McDonald's got their lights on. And someone's scraping off, the, scraping off the parking lot. I mean, it's nearly clean. And my, my wife pointed out later that there's a little parachute jump place. Their parking lot was completely clean. And yet on the, on, the, on the television, there were all these notices of all these churches that were canceling services. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, church after church after church after church closed because of snow. But there's no McDonald's on there. They have no announcement that McDonald's will not be open today to serve junk food. <laughs> and I thought, isn't that interesting? Here, here's McDonald's serving junk food, and it's open for business. And here are all these churches that supposedly have the bread of life, and they're closed. And I was just thankful that I was part of a church, and I was friends of a pastor, and another pastor who started this church who said, no, we don't close. We don't close. What we're doing is too important. We cannot be silent. We cannot stop. Now, we'd never want anybody to take their, their life in their own hands and, and, and do something crazy. Um, although I do that on a regular basis, we wouldn't encourage you to do that. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, church is important. Worship is important. And yet so many are willing to say, well, whatever. And that's what the devil loves to do. He wants to cut you off from sources of supply. And I, know, I know there's some people watching on uh, television today, watching on live stream, and all I would say to you is, why aren't you here? No, I'm kidding. That's a joke. <laughs> we're... we're <laughs> We're glad you're watching. We think it's great. But, but here's the point. The devil doesn't want you to hear what's preached. The devil doesn't want you to hear the songs that are sung. The devil doesn't want you to have the encouragement in the hallway. He wants to cut you off from those sources of supply. And what you need to do is determine up front, he's not going to cut me off. I'm not going anywhere. You know, when we, got, when we went to bed last night, we didn't even consider the possibility of not being here for church this morning. I remember when I was here before, I think it was Leon and Connie Demaret that lived in Kansas City, Kansas. And every time there was a snowstorm or there was a problem, they were among the first two people that were here for church. And they drove the farthest. And we'd have people that would live right here in the neighborhood. And well, we just couldn't, we couldn't get out. You know, it's just a little too hard to get out. And it's like, really? Well, that's what the devil tries to do to you. And that's exactly what King Ben Hadad here. And they, so they cut off all the food, all the water, all the supplies. They created a massive famine, verse 25 says. Now, it had gotten so bad, they'd resorted to eating the heads of donkeys, dove, dung, and most tragically, even their own children. It's in verses 25 to 31. Now, eating donkeys' heads, that's kind of silly. That's, uh, that's junk food. There's no nutritional value whatsoever in a donkey's head. But when you get desperate, 
and you don't know what the real, the real solution is, instead of trusting God, like Elisha said, they were trusting, well, we'll just eat this donkey's head. You know, I know a lot of Christians, I know a lot of churches trying to sustain themselves on junk food. It won't work. But number two, the Bible says they were eating dove dung. So why, why does the Bible give us details like that? Well, the waste of the dove was symbolic of its past experience. Where the dove had been, what it had eaten, which was now eliminated from his body. They were literally feasting on the past. I know a lot of Christians and a lot of churches do that too. Their best days are behind them. And friend, if, that, if that's the way you feel, you're headed in the wrong direction. Our best days are not behind us. Our best days are in front of us, no matter what age or stage of life. If we're following Jesus, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. The third thing they were eating was their own children, cannibalism. They were eating their seed and destroying any future harvest. Well, in the midst of that great famine, the king is so angry, king of Israel, he wants to kill Elisha. Let's just get rid of the preacher. Verse 31. And so he sends a messenger down to Elisha's house. And verse 32 is an interesting statement. It says, Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. Everybody else had taken up a position of panic, but Elisha and the elders are calmly sitting there. Why? Because they trusted the Lord. And in that setting, Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flour will be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. And verse 2 says, chapter 7, Then the, king, the captain, on whose hand the king leaned, said to the man of God, If the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And Elisha said to him, You shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat any of it. And it's in that context we're introduced to four lepers who are sitting outside the gate. And we pick up the narrative in 2 Kings chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Would you stand for the reading of God's word this morning? 2 Kings chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. But Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord, thus says the Lord. Tomorrow about this time a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. And the captain on whose hand the king leaned to the man of God said, If the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? But he said, You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance to the gate. And they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, Let us enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. So now come, let, let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. In fact, their plan was they, they, they might get killed, but at least they could have a meal before they died. So they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots and of horses and the sound of a great army. So they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to come against us. So they fled away in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was, and fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent and ate and drank, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. You may be seated and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now the key to the entire passage is verse 9 where it says, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. You and I are in a similar situation today. Like the four lepers, for the most part, we've been rejected by society. We've found in Jesus what the people in our city and the people in our world desperately need more than their next breath. But too many of us have grown content to keep the good news to ourselves. We've got the good news. Our, our family's got the good news. Our, our friends have got the good news. We're just pretty comfortable with that. And, 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 and we just don't even think about the people outside the walls of the church who are dying on their way to hell without Christ. 
Well, there are five lessons we can learn from these lepers, and I'll go quickly. Number one, it was a message of deliverance from death. It was a message of deliverance from death. The, le the lepers had found the answer. They'd found what everybody else needed. They had something that everyone else needed to escape certain death. Now the lepers ate and they drank. They, they were stuffed. They found silver and gold, all kinds of clothing. No doubt they find, found swords and knives and helmets and shields and tents and bedding. They, they found all kinds of stuff. And verse 8 says they went and hid it in a hole in the ground. Where's your stuff, by the way, that you found, the blessings that God's given to you? So I live in a sophisticated hole. It's a, it's a 4,000 square foot hole that keeps all of my stuff. Others of you say, oh yeah, no, no, the, 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 the hole we have is way nicer than that. In fact, in fact we, we, have to, there, we have storage holes. We go pay money at a storage building to keep all the blessings that God's given us. And we get all of our needs met and, and we keep all this stuff for ourselves and yet the world is dying and going to hell and when there's appeal made to start a new campus or build a new building or fund a new mission, we go, well, you know, I just really don't have any money available. We become just like the, the lepers. Now remember these lepers, they, they were outcasts. They'd literally been thrown out of the city. They, they, they had nothing, but now they had everything that they could ever possibly want. And verse 9 says, after they'd eaten to their heart's content, buried all they could carry to their nearest hole, they came to the realization, well, this isn't right. This is a day of good news, and we're keeping it to ourselves. Now think about this for a moment. These lepers, shunned by the people of the city of Samaria, sent outside the city walls to die with nothing on their backs except their clothes, they realize now they had everything those people needed. Now, what would you be tempted to do? Well, I'll show them. Well, I'm not about to give them. I mean, the way they treated me, are you kidding me? But what was the attitude of these lepers? Hey, we, we, we got to go help these people. Are you going to tell me that church members shouldn't have better attitudes than four lepers? Are you going to suggest to me that the God's people who are part of a great church like this, that our response should be anything less than what these lepers did? Ladies and gentlemen, you and I have found the answer in Jesus Christ. We have exactly what everyone in our city and everyone in our world desperately needs. And don't you realize that if they don't get Jesus, they're going to burn in hell? You know, most people have no concept of hell. I, I witnessed an actual cremation one time. And uh, a friend of mine ran a funeral home, and, and he said, would you like to see a cremation? I said, well, not really. But he said, well, you really ought to see one. I said, no, I don't really think so. And he said, no, I'd really be good for you if you saw one. And so we went out in this big warehouse area, and then they had this big vault, and, and, and they, had a, they had a gentleman they were going to cremate. I never saw the gentleman. He was inside the box. But they pushed this box in there, and they turned the switch, and I saw all of these flames come on underneath, on the sides, on the top. And uh, they closed this door, and in a matter of just what seemed like seconds to me, they raised the door and all was in there was ashes. And I, I decided right then, I, I don't ever want that for me. And number two, I thought, hell is so much worse than that. But we have no concept of that. The people are going to be in a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and the flame never goes out if they don't know Jesus. How can we remain silent when we have the good news they desperately need? Here's the second thing. It was a message that sounded too good to be true. Verses 10 and 12. Some doubted the message by the lepers. They went back to the city gate. They said, hey, we found food. The Syrians are gone. There's, there, there's all kinds of stuff here. There's more than enough for everybody. And on the wall, they said, this is a trick. This is a trick. No, don't open the gates. This is a trick. This is too good to be true. This can't be right. You can read it. It's all in the text. Some do the same thing with the message of the gospel. Some doubt they need it. Others doubt the reality of it. Others make fun of it. Ronnie in the video was talking about doing surveys. We used to do it all the time. And I, Janice and I remember walking down the streets of the new, newest neighborhoods here. And, and I remember one night we were, we, were doing, we were out doing surveys and we were, we were walking down the street and we walked up a home that had one of those glass front doors, not a screen door, but glass. And there were a whole bunch of people in there having a party. And, and I knocked on the door and they came to the door and, and I asked the very question that Ronnie said, hey, we're out taking a survey, just trying to find out if folks go to church or not. And the guy didn't even answer my question. He just started laughing and turned and walked back to the table. And uh, we walked off his porch, and we walked down the driveway, and I, I'm going to be honest with you, that hurt. That was tough. 
But, but God dropped into my spirit. They're not laughing at you. They're laughing at me. It's okay. Go to the next house. And so we did. And sure enough, I mean, all the, all the, all the Saturdays out knocking on doors, inviting kids to come and, and ride on a bus, they all didn't say they'd come, but a lot of them did. And when we did those surveys, a lot of the people didn't want to hear anything we had to say, but a lot of them did. Our job was to go. Our job was to be faithful, even though we'd been rejected. We had the answer. We still have the answer they need. Sometimes people doubt the message of the good news because it sounds too good to be true. Or they think, well, there's no way God would ever use me. It doesn't matter. We still have to share the message. It shouldn't have any effect whatsoever on our passion to share it. Now, I know there are momentary, there are temporary times when you think, you know, this isn't worth it. I don't like being laughed at. I, n- none of us like that. But friend, I want to tell you something. If you keep going and you keep sowing seed, you're going to see the fruits of that. But we must go. There's a third message. Third lesson, it was a message of urgency. Verse 9, the people of Samaria were desperate. They were starving to death. Some had already died. Others would no doubt die before these lepers could get back to the city gates. That's why the message was urgent. But you know, if you think about it, the message that you and I have this morning is even more urgent. We have the greatest message in the world, the solution to every problem on the planet. Amen? Now, that sounded like a Presbyterian church. Let me say that again. We have the solution to every problem on the planet. Amen? Amen. There you go. And now I'm back in the right place. That's good. That's good. Listen, we have the only hope this hopeless world has, Jesus Christ. And God hasn't called us to be content with what we have and just sit here until we die. Us four, no more, bolt the door. Even though a lot of other churches and a lot of other Christians are doing just that. They're perfectly content with what they've got. You know, my wife and I drove around here yesterday looking at the, the, the first apartment we lived in, and we took pictures of the house we lived in. And I, and I drove around this, this, this area, and I, I saw a lot of churches that looked like they did 41 years ago when I left here. This church doesn't look the same. Four campuses now. Nothing's holding this church back. Nothing's stopping you. We can't be content. We can't just sit here. We've got to be passionate. We've got to be urgent. I remember one time years ago, we had, a, we had a snowstorm similar to what happened here last night, except this time it was, it was an all-day snowstorm, and, and, and uh, we were up here at the office, and, and it was probably around 4.30, 5 o'clock, and I was getting ready to leave, and we'd had, it was probably six, eight inches of snow, and, and uh, I was getting ready to leave, and Ronnie said, uh, uh, Bearcat, be back here at 6.30, we're going calling. <laughs> and I said, tonight? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we're going, guys, be here at 6.30. I said, but, but there's... There's snow everywhere. I mean, it was like 6 or 8. And so I said, beer at 6.30. I said, okay, yes, sir. So I, I drove home. It took me about an hour to get home. And when I got home, I pulled up our driveway, barely made it in there and went inside. And, and uh, Janice was in there. And, and uh, she, said, she said, how was work today? I said, it was great, whatever. And, of course, she didn't believe that. She thought we played all the time, which we did. And uh, so then we were, we, 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 we were, I said, we got to eat dinner because Ronnie and I are going calling. And I got to be at the church at 6.30. And she said, tonight? And I go, yeah. She says, well, there's snow everywhere. I go, I, I know. And so we, uh, we ate our little dinner, and, and I went out to get in my car. And look, God is my witness. I couldn't even get touch the door of my car. I slid down the driveway to the street. And it was like, this is nuts. And I tried to get back up there, and, and I got snow all over me. I can't even get into my car. And after about four or five tries, because I'm, I'm one of those people that, that if you say I can't do it, I'll, I'll find a way to do it. And I'm trying to make it work, and I can't make it work. So finally, I go in, and I call Ronnie. We didn't have cell phones back then. So I called him on the phone. I said, Ronnie, I, was like, I, uh, I can't get out of my driveway. I can't go call tonight. He said, I'll come pick you up. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, about an hour and a half later, he comes and picks me up. It's like 7.30, 8 o'clock at night already. And, he come, and sure enough, there's old white Bonneville, and he's out there honking on the horn. And somehow I made it down to his car. And, and we got in the car, and we got out of our little neighborhood, got on to Antioch, and we, we came driving down the street. I mean, there wasn't even any other tire tracks on the road. Nobody was on the road. And I said to Ronnie, I said, I said, I said hey, Ronnie, how many other preachers do you think are out calling tonight? He said, oh, probably none. He said, but that's why we're reaching us the lost. And we went to a town home. I don't even remember where it was, but I remember going there, and, and, and we were walking up the house. I mean, there was snow up to my knees. I mean, and we're just, it's just unbelievable. We come up in front of this house, and you can hear the people arguing inside. 
I mean, they're going at it. And I said, Ronnie, we, 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 we should not bother these people. That we should go. And he goes, no, they, they, they need what we, and I'm going, oh, brother, okay. <laughs> sure enough, they opened the door. And I mean, they kept arguing even when we went inside. And, and it was just, it was unbelievable. They had a teenage daughter and, and uh, Ronnie let them go for a little bit. And they said, you know what the problem is, folks? That Jesus isn't in this home. You, you folks need Jesus. And if Jesus was the center of your life, you wouldn't be yelling at each other. And yet, precious teenage daughter you have, she wants to have a mom and daddy who, who love Jesus. And they said, well, can you tell us how we can have Jesus? He said, I sure can. And I watched him graciously and lovingly lead those people to Christ in 68 inches of snow. And then he said, after he prayed, he goes, could I borrow your phone? I thought, what, what's he doing now? And he gets up and he goes over and he dials the chairman of the elders, Bob Oaks. He said, Bob, can you get to the church and uh, he turned the baptistry heater on? We're going to have some baptisms tonight. Now, those people didn't even know they were getting ready to go get baptized, but <laughs> he was making the preparations and what could they say? And I remember we came down here to the church that night. It was like 1030 at night now and baptized those three people and they became a part of our church. And I remember us going home, and, and, and I didn't get home. It was almost midnight by the time we got home. And, and uh, I, I got out of the car, and I said to Ryan, I said, I, I, that was pretty neat tonight. And he goes, yeah, it was. See you tomorrow. Like it was just common, ordinary. This is what we ought to be doing. And don't think that didn't leave an impression on me to this very second. And it ought to leave an impression on you, too. We ought to be urgent about our witness for Christ. First of all, we ought to be urgent about our personal faithfulness, living our faith, serving in the church. By the way, if you're not serving in the church, you're late for duty. I've said to people for years, you're never really going to be happy until you're serving in God's church somewhere doing something. You know, one of the things that made this church grow as fast as it did in those early years of 47 people, every, nobody did everything, but everybody did something. And, you know, we got here about nine years later at the end of the 70s, and, and, and there was something about this church. Everybody was involved. Everybody did something. What are you doing? Don't be late for, don't be late for work. Find a place. Be urgent about it. Tell people about Jesus. we got to be urgent. Here's a fourth thing. It was a message for everybody, verses 8 to 16. It wasn't just for the lepers. Sure, they got their needs met and more. But then they realized this isn't right. we got to share with others. Friend, listen, you're, you're not going to run out. When you, when you share Jesus Christ with other people, you're not going to run out. And you're going to find out that he will more than meet every need of your life as you're busy trying to meet the needs of others. It was for everyone. In fact, verse 16 says there, were, there was so much food, they were practically giving it away, verse 16. They went from a ferocious famine to a fabulous feast in the space of a day. So I, I don't think God does that kind of stuff anymore. You know, you, you know why? You know why you don't see God do that kind of stuff anymore? Because you don't believe God can do that kind of stuff anymore. He's still doing it. We're just not seeing it, which leads me to the fifth lesson. It was a message that was refused by some. Verses 17 to 20. Some just refused to believe the message. Remember the captain who the king leaned on his arm? He said, ah, oh, that'll never happen. Even if God opened the windows of heaven, this will never happen. And the fact of the matter is, he sealed his fate with his unbelief. Because he doubted what God could do, he missed what God did. Don't let that happen to you. Because he doubted what God could do, he missed what God did. Some will always reject the message. Doesn't matter what we do. In fact, over in Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse uh, 13, he said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and, lead, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. But the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Remember the rich young ruler? Jesus told him the, the cost of discipleship, and he said, you know what? That's just, that's just too much to, to ask for somebody. And he went away sad, the Bible says. Some will always reject the message. But listen, that doesn't change the validity of our message or the urgency of our, our sharing it. One more thing I want you to notice. Did, did you notice when God moved? In verses 5 to 7, God didn't move until the lepers moved. Look, notice in verse 5, it says, At twilight, the lepers got up. But I want you to notice something. In verse 7, when they got up, God came down in power. Verse 7, it says, In the twilight, God came. Now, now, now I want you to understand what happened here. These four lepers decided to get up in the twilight, and when they got up, God came down. 
What's God waiting on you to do? What is it that, that, that could happen, that should happen, that, that must happen in this church, but it hasn't happened yet because God's waiting on you? Now, I want you to also notice the, the, the twilight. You know, what time, you know what time of the day that is? It's the darkest part of the night. It's the time between dawn and sunrise. It, it, it's the darkest time. They got up while it was still dark. They were literally walking in the dark on their leprous limbs, taking steps of faith. They, they could only see the, the next step, and that's the step they took. You know, I'm think, I was thinking this morning, you and I are living in some, some dark days right now. In fact, some people say these are among the darkest days we've ever lived in. And I'll just say to you this morning, we, we, we can't just sit here in the dark. We need to get up and do something. We need to do something about the darkness. If there's ever been a time when we need to let our light shine, it's now. Here's the point of the message. God hasn't called you and I to just sit here waiting for something to happen. If we just sit here and wait for something to happen, I can guarantee you what will happen. Nothing. But if we'll get up and start walking by faith, I can guarantee you what will happen. God will come down in power, and he will do something so great, it will bless every single person in this city and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a day of good news, and we dare not keep it to ourselves. What do you say on this 50th anniversary? We'll get up and do something about it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege you've given to us to be a part of this great celebration this weekend and the privilege to be a part of this church. And God, to see how many thousands of people have had their lives affected for eternity because Ronnie and Darlene and their precious family and 47 people total decided to start a church in this area of Kansas City. It's become a veritable lighthouse, helping people who made a shipwreck of their life find, find their way to Jesus. And God, now with four campuses all over this Metroplex area, and God, I know there, there are more to come, surely. And I pray that you would just give a, you would give a witness to this church and you would give a wealth of resources to this church, both people and finances, that they would be able to do whatever it is their hand finds to do to bring people to Christ. And God, I pray you'd help every one of us to follow the example of those four lepers and get up and do something right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I asked uh, Barry to, I said, he said, what do, you want me, what do you want me to do? And I said, I want you to challenge us. Are you sufficiently challenged, right, to take the gospel uh, to people that need it, to share what we have, to share the blessings, the grace that God's given us? Uh, I want to, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, my, my dad sitting here, he, he got, he had a, a, an amb ambulance call, rushed to, the, rushed to the hospital, we got the call, hey, your dad's in the hospital, uh, the ambulance went down there, and he was having some really bad uh, pain and uh, some conditions, and he had to go get a bunch of tests and do a bunch of stuff, and I, I will, was honestly, uh, one of the things that was on my heart is I thought we were going to lose him, and he wasn't going to be here for this 50th anniversary. And uh, God has uh, been gracious, and he's kind of rallied in his, in his health, and, uh, and they were get to be here a part of that. Uh, but one of the things that motivated me to do as soon as he got feeling a little better was to get in that studio and cut all these interviews. So we have really, you guys have seen small clips of about two hours of discussion. And uh, one of the things I wanted him to do, uh, we, we cut these things up to introduce all these old wells uh, and one of the things I wanted him to do before we got done was I wanted him to tell a story that uh, I've heard him tell hundreds of times. And uh, my dad uh, is a, a gifted evangelist. Barry is a gifted evangelist. Uh, it's, it's maybe third or fourth on my list. Uh, I have some really strong strengths. I'm a teacher, and, and I have some strong organizational abilities, and, and there's some spiritual gifts that I have. But evangelism is the... Um, that's the message of the church. That's the core mission of the church. And, and God gives us people like me to teach us, to help us maybe get organized and to equip people to, to go do evangelism. And then he gives us these guys that are evangelists to go show us 
how to do what the teacher said and, uh, and to live that out. And, and my dad had that heart and that, that was the heart that started this church. And one of the stories that, that I wanted to tell is his father died uh, when he was 12 years old. His dad was 42 years old. And one of the things that dad's told us is that he, he had no reason to believe that his dad knew Jesus. And uh, he you know, didn't go to church. His dad didn't pray. His dad didn't carry a Bible around. He was a good man. He was a good dad. But just, just no evidence that he was, in fact, evidence he wasn't walking with the Lord, that, that Lord Jesus wasn't the Lord of his life. And uh, dad graduated from high school, went off and played a couple of years of minor league baseball and, and uh, became a Christian at church camp his senior year in high school. While away from home, really got a call to the ministry and came home and went and enrolled at Ozark Christian College. And sometime after being at Ozark, he came and uh, came back to the Miami uh, uh, hometown, went to the cemetery, and was at his dad's grave. And he's told this story that he that it, he just it just kind of broke him because he just didn't know where his dad was. He it, he he had this passion to to give his life to telling people about Jesus, and and he just. Did his dad, no one had told his dad about Jesus. And he, he's told this story about praying that God just helped me live my life in such a way that there's some other boys that, that will not be in this situation, that they will know that their father is in heaven when, when he passes. And I asked dad to tell that story, and he started to tell the story, and then he got sidetracked and told another story. <laughs> and um, I want you to see this story, and this will be kind of what we'll use to get us on to uh, the end of our anniversary celebration. But I want to tell you something that maybe you don't know. Uh, it was several years later that uh, we had a family that joined our church, and uh, the girl's name was Gwen Foster. Yeah. And uh, she told me something that her great aunt had told her. And I had never heard this. But this well, is this is years after you've been in ministry, yeah. hemorrhaging for the loss. Yes. Yeah. And she told me that my great aunt had gone to the hospital in Joplin to visit my father when he was dying. And she witnessed to him, told him about Jesus, and led him to make a decision for Christ. And he confessed his faith in Jesus to her. And I, I'd gone through most of my adulthood and never heard this. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life to have heard that because I'd gone through all these years wondering where dad was. And so uh, it's been great how the Lord has unfolded these things and brought to me some real comfort about my father who I loved more than I could possibly express. He was my friend. He was my fishing buddy, my hunting buddy. And uh, I always knew he would do anything in the world for me. And uh, now I have a hope that I'll see him in heaven. Because somebody went and shared the gospel with him. I was so, I'm so thankful they did. And I want to be that person for someone else. Yeah. So Legacy's logo is a torch. And a torch is, uh, represents the, the light, which is Jesus, and the light that is the gospel. And the purpose of the church is to, is to shine forth in the darkness, to, to hold up the torch. And friends, every one of you who are members of this church, you're, you're either running the last leg of your race, and it's your job right now to, to successfully hand that torch off to someone else who's going to carry that light. Or it's, or it's your time to run, and you need to carry that torch, and you need to shine it everywhere. And there's a, probably a few of you that are young that it, it's, it's already time for you to do it, but you, if you're not carrying the torch, you need to get ready. You need to equip yourself to carry that torch. Because we've had 50 years of incredible blessings that God has bestowed upon us. And we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. But the next 50 years is what 
if the Lord tarries, it's ours. And we either need to carry that torch or we need to be passing that torch on. That, that's what, you're here now. You're here now. And you're like, those, you're like those lepers sitting there feasting. And there's a world that is starving and devouring their children. And we've got to take the gospel. Uh, and as soon as we get up on our leprous limbs, try, try that seven times fast. As soon as we get up on our leprous limbs and move, God's going to come down. Next Sunday, uh, we're going to uh, start a new sermon series uh, leading up to Easter. And we're going to have our next big celebration, you know, it's going to be Easter Sunday. And, and next week, we're going to start a sermon series. And <clears throat> i got to start working on the sermon, okay? It's a relentless return. This was over, and the next week comes, relentless return of the Sabbath. But I don't know what we're going to say exactly, but I know where we're going to be. Because we're, we're going to spend the next few weeks studying what the Bible says about the real Jesus, and we're going to be looking at all the passages where Jesus said, I am. And we're going to, we're going to see not what the world says, but, but who Jesus says that he is. And if you have a friend, if you have a coworker, if you have a neighbor, if you have anyone you care about or someone that, that has someone that you care about who cares about somebody, this is a great time to bring them to church. And I, I want to ask you, uh, as you leave here today, to do a couple things. One is eat some donuts, okay? Uh, finish them up, because I'll be tempted to finish them up uh, this week, and we want to get those donuts out of here. And uh, the, the other thing, though, is I, I, I would ask you to pray that God would open your eyes, that he would lay a name, uh, that he would, he would open your eyes to, to that person that you deal with every day, to that neighbor, that coworker, that friend. Who is it? You can shine your light. Who is it that you can invite to come and, and discover Jesus, the real Jesus, to meet Jesus? Because he is the bread of life. He is the way, the truth, life. He's the one that will change your life. Right now, at all of our campuses, I'm going to ask you all to stand. And at every campus, uh, if our elders or our prayer warriors would go to the cross, you know, um, uh, somewhere at your campus on the side, there's a cross that, and it's lit up. And right now there's some people going to that, probably up front on one of the wings of, of the building. And um, if you're here today and, and you're not sure about your relationship with Jesus, you're not sure where you're going to uh, spend eternity, uh, do not leave this building without doing business with God. And, and those guys or those guys and gals at the foot of that cross are there to, to share with you and to, and to pray for you. What, whatever the burden, uh, don't leave without doing your business with God. And the rest of us, let's leave waiting for God, listening to God to know where we're going to shine that light. Who are you going to invite next week? Who are you going to invite next week to learn about the great I am? who walk this earth. It will change their life. It will change your life. Father, we thank you so much for, for 50 years of your faithfulness and 50 years of your blessing. And Father, we are so thankful for all that have, have gone before us, all that have, have run their race and are now at the portals of heaven as a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on. And, and Father, I, I pray that you would help each of us today to be faithful and to see clearly the course that you have put before us. And Father, I, I pray you would bring these names, that you would, you would open these doors of opportunity. And Lord, there'd be no doubt that these, these are doors that you have opened. And Father, I pray that, that with no excuses, we would do whatever it takes to step through those doors and, and to share the gospel to share the good news about your grace and, and what you have done for us and what you want to do for whosoever will come. In Jesus' name we ask these things, amen.